Hello and welcome to Early Intervention Training Program's Webinar Wednesdays. Today our topic will be understanding the neurocognitive effects and developmental outcomes of low-level lead toxicity. And this is presented by uh, Amy Zimmerman, who is the Legal Counsel for Health Justice and Director of the Legal Counsel's Chicago Medical Legal Partnership for Children, and Dr. Nicole Hamp, who is a pediatric resident at the University of Chicago Comer Children's Hospital. Uh, they will both share with you a little bit more information about themselves probably, but we'll move on forward and uh, just let you know that the person speaking here is Maria Maddox, that's me, and I am the moderator for today. So if there are any questions, I will be helping to address those. All right, um, Amy and Nikki, you want to go ahead and start? Thanks, everyone, for listening in. Uh, we, we have an initial question for you. We'd like you to think about... Uh, the children you serve and their insurance questions. So as we're going through this presentation, think about what percentage of children you serve are enrolled in Medicaid or all kids, because it's relevant to some of the inquiries and requirements that, um, as part of lead testing and screening. The objectives for the presentation today are to understand how lead exposure occurs and methods of prevention, to explore the developmental implications of lead exposure and the long-term impact on child outcomes, to appreciate the role of early intervention in improving outcomes for children who have been lead exposed and some of the strategies that may be employed, and to discuss current early intervention pilot work and statewide efforts. Lead has been in the news a lot lately, with the most focused national attention on the Flint water crisis. Closer to Illinois, in the summer of 2016, the media highlighted the significant amount of lead that was identified in the soil of East Chicago, Indiana, forcing people out of their homes and requiring court-ordered remediation that is ongoing. And in Chicago in 2017, drinking fountains in Chicago public schools and Chicago park districts were shut off after closer inspection identified lead risk, garnering more media coverage. We have our first question. What is the most common source of lead exposure? Is it A, water flowing through pipes with lead parts, B, lead paint, C, lead glazed ceramics such as plates and cups, or D, children's toys and jewelry? We'll give you a second to think about that. The answer is B, lead paint. Lead paint dust is the most common way that children are exposed to lead. Inside the home, most lead dust comes from chipping and flaking paint, or when paint, dry paint is scraped, sanded, or disturbed during home remodeling. Although lead paint is responsible for the majority of lead exposure, that day-to-day -day risk, primarily found in children's homes or homes where they spend time, like childcare, doesn't attract the media attention or federal, state, and private resources necessary to mitigate and abate lead hazards in order to protect children from exposure and help ensure their safety. It wasn't until the 1970s that lead was removed from new paint, even though the risk had been known for at least half a century. Lead gasoline for cars was not completely phased out until the 1990s, and lead pipes and plumbing were permitted for use in construction as recently as 1986. Despite these efforts and more, the U.S. has failed to eliminate lead hazards completely. Lead paint is still present in many homes built before 1978, when the Consumer Product Safety Commission banned it for residential use. Within those homes, it is the peeling paint around windows and door frames and on porches that is of most concern, predominantly because of lead paint dust created from degraded paint. Exposure is often exacerbated in housing that is not well maintained. Other important sources of lead include the dirt, soil, and gravel near major roadways or at sites of previously demolished homes and public housing, Consumer products, including old painted furniture, old lead painted furniture, and lead service lines. 15 to 22 million people in the U.S. get water through lead service lines. When these pipes corrode or are being repaired or replaced, lead can leach into the water. Understanding the sources of exposure is especially important for professionals 
working in children's homes, because you may be our best resource to educate families in real time and real space, not only about the lead hazards that may be present in and around the home, you can also talk to families about how to protect against exposure and remind them to talk to their children's medical provider about blood lead testing. If a mother is exposed to lead during pregnancy, her baby is at risk for a number of health challenges. Lead can hurt a baby's brain, kidneys, and nervous system, and cause the baby to have learning or behavioral problems later on. It also puts the baby at risk for miscarriage. A baby exposed to lead before birth is more likely to be premature, have slowed growth, and low birth weight. The CDC recommends that pregnant and lactating women with a current or past blood lead level of greater than five or above should be assessed for the adequacy of their diet and provided with prenatal vitamins and nutritional advice, emphasizing adequate calcium and iron intake. While studies indicate that there is little transfer of lead to the infant in breast milk, if a mother has a blood lead level of 40 or greater, which is very high, they are recommended to avoid breastfeeding and instead pump and discard the milk until the blood lead level drops to under 40. Here's another question for you. What percentage of Illinois homes were built before 1978? Is it A, 85%, B, 73%, C, 66%, D, 54%, or E, 44%? And the answer is C, 66% according to the Illinois Department of Public Health 2015 lead surveillance report. In fact, 66% of homes and 81% of Chicago homes so Illinois homes and 81% of Chicago homes were built before 1978. Of those homes, lead-based paint remains in 75%. That means many of the families you engage with are living in homes with lead-based paint hazards. These pictures give you an idea of what obvious, obvious degraded surface lead can look like. As you can see, it tends to become brittle, and the paint has surface cracks resembling crocodile skin. And just in case the overwhelming number of homes with lead paint doesn't induce some paranoia, check out the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission website for lists of products that have been pulled from the market because of unsafe lead levels. We have some listed here. And what we find most troublesome is that a lot of these come from recognized and trusted household brands like Pier 1 and Restoration Hardware. In 2012, of the 99 different items taken from branches of Claire's, Forever 21, and H&M, and other retailers, 25% contain levels of lead over 300 parts per million, which far exceeds the Consumer Product Safety Commission limit of 100 parts per million in children's products. This happens because imported products don't always face rigorous lead standards in the countries where they are manufactured. Examples we have seen in Illinois include lead in jewelry and children's lunch boxes made in China, lead in Mexican candy and ceramic pottery, coal makeup from India, and imported herbal substances. In order to best help children who have been lead poisoned, it is imperative to understand exposure. Amy just went through the main sources of lead and explained where exposures occur, but now it is important to ask how they occur. True or false? Adults and children are, are at equal risk of lead exposure. What do you think? The answer is false. Children are at increased risk of lead exposure and the toxic effects of lead. So why are kids at increased risk? Well, first, they have increased exposure. From a behavioral perspective, they have increased exposure because they are on the ground, they are crawling, exploring their environment, and practicing hand-to-mouth behavior. And from a physiologic perspective, they have increased exposure because they have higher baseline respiratory rates, so they inhale more lead dust than do adults. Second, they have an immature blood-brain barrier, allowing lead to cross into the brain more easily and impact the developing nervous system. Third, after consumption, Children absorb more lead from the GI tract than adults. They can absorb up to 70% of lead that has been ingested, whereas adults absorb only about 20%.
And finally, once absorbed, children retain more lead than adults. Children younger than two years of age retain approximately one half of absorbed lead, whereas adults retain ultimately only about 1%. For children, even a one-time exposure can cause harm. Which kids are at the greatest risk? Those at highest risk for lead exposure include children less than six years of age, particularly those between 12 and 36 months, those with persistent oral behaviors, those with poor hygiene, poor hygiene or poor nutrition, including low iron and calcium levels. Also, children living in urban, low-income households, children from minority families, and of course, those residing in deteriorating pre-1970s housing. The graph on this slide highlights data from the 2015 Illinois Surveillance Report that found that 42% fewer white children compared to black children had lead levels greater than or equal to 10 micrograms per deciliter, and 25% fewer white children compared to both black and Hispanic children had lead levels greater than or equal to 5. This discrepancy between the lead levels in minority and non-minority children is one that is echoed in data sets across the country. True or false, chelation removes all lead in the body? The answer is false. A blood lead level of 45 requires hospitalization for chelation treatment to remove lead in the bloodstream in order to avoid an acute encephalopathy that can lead to seizures, coma, and even death. Chelating agents remove lead from the blood and soft tissues, including the brain. Treatment is usually guided by the poison control center in conjunction with the treating physicians at the admitting hospital. Specific chelation treatments have been shown to decrease mortality from 66% to between 1 and 2%. Unfortunately, however, in contrast to the effects on mortality and acute symptoms, chelation therapy does not affect the chronic neurocognitive effects of lead toxicity. And once the initial course of chelation is completed, ongoing monitoring of blood lead levels is required, and children may require additional chelation treatments. Re-exposure or chronic exposure to lead increases morbidity and mortality. The picture on this slide is from an article in the Chicago Tribune in April of last year. It is of Tolanda McMullen and her six-year-old son, Mateo taken during a blood draw at La Robita Hospital. Mikhail was exposed to lead in his home on the south side of Chicago and had lead levels as high as 69, requiring chelation therapy and a move to public housing, where, unfortunately, he was re-exposed to lead. Thus, he underwent a second round of chelation therapy. He remains nonverbal and struggles with developmental delays. Studies have proven that chelation is not effective for reversing the neurocognitive effects of lead once an exposure has occurred. One possible explanation for this is the way that lead is distributed in the body. The title of this slide is really a misnomer because lead is not metabolized, but rather it is directly absorbed, distributed, and excreted. Lead can be inhaled, and while some is cleared from the airway through our body's innate defense systems, up to 30 to 50 percent of inhaled lead dust is ultimately absorbed into the bloodstream. Similarly, when lead is ingested, some clears from the GI system without ever being absorbed. However, when we ultimately absorb, somewhere between 5 and 50 percent. Remember, too, that children absorb a greater proportion of lead from the GI tract than do adults. Factors such as fasting, iron deficiency, and calcium deficiency can also increase the gastrointestinal absorption of lead. Once absorbed from the GI or respiratory tract, lead is distributed between three compartments, including the blood, the soft tissues, and the mineralized tissues. More than 70% of absorbed lead ends up in the bones. The rest is distributed between blood and soft tissues. Thus, blood lead levels are not very accurate reflections of the total body lead burden. The half-life of lead in these various compartments depends on the specific compartment and the age of the individual. However, on average, lead stays in the blood 28 to 36 days, in the soft tissues for about 40 days, and in the bones for over 25 years. 
Once in the bones, lead lands in one of two compartments, a labile compartment that readily exchanges lead with the blood, and an inert compartment that is mobilized during periods of stress on the body, for example, during pregnancy, lactation, fractures, or in times of disease. Therefore, lead in bones can allow for blood lead levels to remain elevated long after an initial exposure has occurred. And because the lead accumulate and because the body accumulates lead over a lifetime and releases it slowly, lead toxicity may occur without another major acute exposure. Finally, lead is excreted by the kidneys and GI tract. Adults are able to excrete more lead than our children. Once absorbed, lead, once absorbed, lead interferes with the interactions of divalent cations and sulfhydryl groups, and thus has widespread physiologic effects, as these interactions are involved in most biochemical reactions in the body. Basically, what that means is that lead looks like a lot of other stuff, like calcium and iron, that is naturally included in normal body functions. And when lead is incorrectly incorporated into these processes, Instead of calcium and iron, it leads to cell death and ir irreversible damage. While lead has effects throughout the body, there really are three main sy systems that are impacted. Those include red blood cell production, the kidneys, and the central and peripheral nervous system, which is the system I am going to focus on. The question is, how much lead is safe? And the answer is really none. We have long known that lead is toxic to the body at high levels because at these levels, there are outward symptoms, including headache, abdominal pain, constipation, and even encephalopathy that can lead to seizures, altered consciousness, coma, and or death. However, since the late 1970s, a growing body of research demonstrates that lead causes irreversible asymptomatic effects far below levels previously considered safe. In the United States, the toxic blood lead level is determined by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and is based upon the understanding of complications caused by a given concentration of lead in the blood, consistent with the research between, consistent with the research between 1970 and 2010, the CDC lowered incrementally the toxic level of lead from 60 to 5, which corresponds to the 97th percentile of blood lead levels in U.S. children. So while policy has been changing, it hasn't been fast enough, and Illinois remains behind, as Illinois' level of concern remains at 10, while the CDC recognizes a reference value to be half that. But you have to ask, what's with the semantics when we all understand that no level of lead exposure is safe for a child? It's because the lead reference level determines when public health actions should be initiated. We will talk about those specifics later, but first, we will focus on the medical effects of lead. As mentioned previously, at high levels, lead poisoning can cause outward symptoms including irritability, loss of appetite, abdominal pain, constipation, and seizures. However, most lead-exposed kids will never show these symptoms because most are exposed to lower levels of lead that leave them initially asymptomatic. Over time, though, they can experience deficits in overall intellectual ability, speech and language processing, visual spatial skills, attention, executive functions and social skills, and fine and gross motor skills. These deficits typically don't become apparent until a child is around school age and often when it is too late to intervene. Now, let's focus on the effects of low-level lead poisoning and take a look at some of the research that supports the toxic effects of lead on learning and development. In 1979, Dr. Herbert Needleman, a pediatrician in Massachusetts, released a groundbreaking study highlighting the correlation between lower-level childhood lead exposure and neurocognitive deficits. Between 1975 and 1978, Dr. Needleman measured dentin lead levels in the lost teeth of 270 six- and seven-year-old children and then evaluated their performance in the first and second grade. He found that those with increased levels of dentin lead were more likely to have lower intelligence scores, impaired speech and language processing, decreased attention, and worse classroom performance. His study controlled for mother's age at the time of birth, mother's IQ, mother's education, family size, and socioeconomic status. 
When these children were reexamined in the fifth grade, children with increased dentin lead still had lower IQ scores than their peers, needed more special education services, and had higher rates of school failure. Then, 11 years later, Dr. Needleman re-examined 132 of the children from the original study and found that those with higher levels of lead were seven times more likely to be high school dropouts, six times more likely to have a reading disability, and for those who stayed in high school, a lower class standing and a higher rate of absenteeism. Dr. Needleman's study was pioneering in that it substantiated claims that lower levels of childhood lead exposure could have wide-ranging effects on learning and behavior, and it proved these effects persisted throughout childhood into adolescence and early adulthood. Later, in 2003, Dr. Richard Canfield, a researcher at Cornell University, looked specifically at the effects of lead at blood lead levels less than 10, which happened to be lower than the CDC level of concern at the time. Canfield took the lead levels of 172 children at 6, 12, 18 months, 2, 3, 4, and 5 years, and then administered a Stanford Binet intelligence scale to these same children at the ages of 3 and 5 years. He found that an increase in blood lead concentration was inversely and significantly associated with IQ. Overall, an increase in lifetime average lead concentration of 1 was associated with a loss of almost half an IQ point. So when looking at a linear model, IQ decreased by 4.6 points for every 10 microgram per deciliter increase in the lifetime average blood lead concentration. However, when blood lead levels are less than 10, loss of IQ points for every 1 microgram increase in blood lead concentration is considerably greater, nearly three times the loss. And using a nonlinear model, IQ declines by about 7.5 points for a lifetime average blood lead concentration of up to 10. So, while Canfield and others established the effects of lead on a child's aptitude by quantifying effects on IQ, Dr. Marie Lynn Miranda, a researcher and the founder of the Children's Environmental Health Initiative, decided to explore the effects of lead on achievement. She did so by linking blood lead surveillance data in 8,600 children between the ages of 1 and 5 years across seven counties in North Carolina to their end of fourth grade testing performance in reading and math. She found that test scores decline as lead levels increase and that this effect is clear at levels less than 10 and even less than 5. She also found that a blood lead level of 5 is associated with a decline in end of grade reading and math scores that is equal to about 15% of the interquartile range. These results were significant for many reasons, but perhaps the most intriguing is the social implications, because at the low end of the distribution, the impact of lead on end of grade test results is sufficient to ensure that some students who would otherwise have passed the test will fail. This, in turn, has implications for retention in grade, and studies have shown that grade retention has been linked to higher dropout rates. In, addi in addition, at the high end of this distribution, the impact of lead on end-of-grade test results will essentially block some students from gaining access to the enriched resources provided through advanced and intellectually gifted programs. Also of note, a higher proportion of non-Hispanic black children had higher levels of blood lead, and you will notice on the graph that black children have lower test scores and higher failure rates across the board, suggesting that greater lead exposure could be a contributing factor to what is often referred to as the achievement gap. And further proving the effect of lead on aptitude is a study released in 2015 by Evans et al. of over 58,000 Chicago-born children that looked retrospectively at blood lead concentration and third grade Illinois standard achievement test reading and math scores. The study found that at a blood lead level of five, children are 30% more likely to fail third grade reading and math tests. Studies have also shown over a four times increased risk of ADHD for children with blood lead levels of greater than two, with approximately one in five cases of ADHD in the United States being attributable 
to lead exposure, a statistic that is cited by the AAP Council on Environmental Health. So now we have reviewed some of the specifics by looking at a handful of influential studies that helped to prove the neurocognitive effects of lead exposure on children. But there have been countless studies proving the toxic effects of low-level lead on learning and development. There have been studies documenting the increased need for special education services, decreased reading readiness, four times increased likelihood of delinquency, increased risk of adult arrest, and even studies that have shown decreased brain matter in the prefrontal and anterior cingulate cortex, which are the areas of the brain responsible for executive functioning and mood regulation, a finding that is consistent with the known neural behavioral outcomes. So all of that to say that there are significant effects of low-level childhood lead exposure that include but are not limited to decreased IQ, decreased cognitive performance, impaired executive functioning, decreased reading readiness with increased rates of reading disabilities, increased incidence of ADHD and behavioral and mood disorders, and increased delinquency. All of these things can have a significant impact on a child's future, including impaired academic performance, underemployment, lower socioeconomic status, increased arrests, and ultimately decreased quality of life. Okay, so now I have a question for you. Which family listed below should receive a childhood lead risk questionnaire at their 12-month well child check? A, a family living in Chicago. B, a family living outside Chicago but in a high-risk zip code. C, a family receiving Medicaid benefits or D, a family on private insurance living outside of a high-risk or Chicago zip code? This is a tricky question and one I would really only expect people who work at pediatric offices to know the answer to, though I'm afraid many would not. The answer is actually D, only a family on private insurance living outside of Chicago in a low-risk zip code would go through the full questionnaire because the children in A, B, and C would all automatically get a blood test. So what are the lead screening guidelines in Illinois? These are the lead screening guidelines from the Illinois Department of Public Health and the Chicago Department of Public Health. As you can see, they aren't exactly straightforward. We have four different guidelines for four different groups of individuals. I won't go through this now, but I'm sure you can appreciate how this can get very complicated. It is important to note, however, that a child between the ages of six months and six years is required to provide certification from a medical provider stating that the child has been tested or screened for lead before he or she can be admitted to a licensed daycare center, daycare home, nursery school, preschool, Head Start program, kindergarten, or any other licensed child care facility. So, what happens if a child screens positive, meaning that he or she has an elevated blood lead level? If a child is found to have a lead level greater than 10, a second confirmatory venous blood test will be completed. If the second screen confirms an elevated lead level, a provider will order any additional tests that may be necessary, assess the child's nutritional status, administer the proper developmental screening, and provide the family with information regarding lead exposure and anticipatory guidance to prevent further exposures. The provider will then notify the IDPH. The local health department should then step in to provide nurse case management services. The nurse case manager will connect the family to various services based on their needs. These could in include environmental home inspection, special education or early intervention referrals, medical care, public assistance programs, and housing resources. Nurse case managers will also educate family on sources of lead, nutrition and prevention, and co conduct or refer for developmental screening if not already done. So what services do you believe the public health department provides a child with an elevated blood lead level between 5 and 10 micrograms per deciliter? A, nurse home visiting only. B, environmental inspection only. C, nurse home visiting and environmental inspection. D, a home lead test kit and brochure. Or E, none of the above. The answer is E. 
the IDPH, or local public health department, does not provide any services automatically for children with lead levels between 5 and 10. However, in Chicago, if a child's lead level is above 5 but below 10, an environmental inspection by a licensed lead inspector can be requested through CDPH by calling 312-747-LED-5323. For the rest of Illinois, there are no provisions, and management or intervention is carried out solely by the child health care provider and the family. So what does the state of lead poisoning in Illinois look like now? Unfortunately, the burden of Illinois childhood lead poisoning remains one of the highest in the nation. In 2015 alone, 10,322 Illinois children ages 6 years and under had blood lead levels at the current recommended federal reference value of greater than or equal to 5, and 1,925 of those children met the current Illinois level of concern at 10 and above. This means that one in every 192 children tested had a lead level of 10 or greater, and one in 25 children tested had a lead level of 5 or greater. The average lead level for Illinois children tested was 2.3. The Miranda study that we referenced earlier found a statistically significant decrease in end-of-grade test scores for children with lead exposure as low as 2. Applying her research findings to our statistics, would mean that around 50% of the children tested for lead in Illinois may have lead levels high enough to experience decreased educational outcomes, and that's only out of the children that we test. Speaking of the children we test, what percentage of Illinois children would you guess received a blood lead screening in 2015? The answer is D. In 2015, only 26% of Illinois children under the age of 5 were tested. However, in Illinois, 50% of children are on Medicaid, so we know that this number should be roughly double. That said, of the kids who were tested in Illinois, 73% were enrolled in Medicaid, indicating that this is the most highly tested group. So what can we do better? I think primary prevention and improved lead education are key but both have proven to be long-term uphill battles that will continue. As a pediatrician, I care about what we can do now to help children who have already been exposed and who are at risk of suffering the consequences. We have a unique opportunity in Illinois to intervene early and change the trajectory of children's lives, and we propose that early childhood programs like Early Intervention and Head Start can be the answer. Why do we feel this way? Well, look at this graphic. These are stained sections of neurons from the brain, and as you can see, the normal newborn has sparse neural circuitry when compared with a two-year-old. In early childhood, there is a period in which the effective neural connections are strengthened and the weak ones die away. This is an important developmental step, the pruning of neural connections, and it is thought to be largely dependent on input from the environment. That is what neural plasticity means. So when it so it stands to reason that if an at-risk toddler is identified and intervention begins either before or while brain connections are being established, that toddler stands the best chance of achieving optimal neurocognitive functioning. What we hope to achieve for children who have been lead poisoned in the state of Illinois is automatic eligibility for early intervention services because we believe that these services offered between birth and three years of age take advantage of a time in a child's life when there is incredible neuroplasticity that may allow them to compensate for the insult. Though we cannot undo the damage that has been done, we can give children who have been lead exposed and their families the skills, the learning, and the opportunity to work around it. And this is where early intervention comes in. As many of you know, early intervention is about supporting families to promote their child's optimal development by encouraging, collaborating, and building plans and strategies around family activities and into daily routines. True or false, children who have been lead exposed are automatically eligible to receive early intervention services. The answer is false. Even though we know that intervention is likely to be more effective and less costly when it is provided earlier in life rather than later, 
Certainly, there are children who have been lead exposed that end up in early intervention because they have either a 30% delay or they have a medical diagnosis which is likely to result in delay. But that is likely only a small fraction of lead exposed children who would benefit from early intervention. Given what Dr. Hamp has taught us about the impacts of lead exposure, combined with EI's positive track record of developmental gain and positive family outcomes for eligible children, it is imperative that we consider EI for lead exposed children, whether or not they are currently exhibiting delay, something we don't currently do in Illinois. More than 10 years ago, IDEA Part C regulations were amended to allow states to include, quote, disorders secondary to exposure to toxic substances, unquote, as an example of a condition that states may adopt for children to automatically qualify for early intervention services. Considering that lead is the number one environmental health hazard faced by children today, we would be remiss to not offer these services to children who have been lead exposed. EI services have the potential to greatly improve the developmental outcomes of infants and toddlers exposed to lead and decrease the likelihood that children will suffer the deleterious effects of lead exposure in their elementary years or later. This means that early intervention has the potential to change a child's developmental trajectory and improve outcomes for children, families, and communities. I'm going to take you through the methodology we are engaging in to help move Illinois to automatic eligibility for EI for children at lead levels of 5 and above, being mindful, of course, that as a state, our public health department doesn't trigger responding to families with both nurse case management and follow-up environmental inspections until children identified with lead levels at 10 and above. We began this work in 2016, propelled by the renewed attention to lead exposure garnered by the Flint lead crisis, a reawakening like I've never before witnessed in my legal career. The process we engaged in includes four steps that I'll take you through. We have completed steps one through three and are about to embark on step four, thanks to funding support from the Illinois Council on Developmental Disabilities. In step one, we conducted a literature review on the health and developmental impacts of lead poisoning, which you've heard a lot about today. We also did a national survey of state requirements for automatic eligibility for early intervention. In step two, the EI and lead work group was assembled by the Early Intervention Council with council members, advocates, pediatricians, and state, city, county, public health agency staff. And we co-chair that work. The work group has been adopted by the Governor's Children's Cabinet, who last year established lead poisoning prevention as one of its top shared priorities. In step three, we conducted an analysis, which has involved mapping lead poisoned children likely to access early intervention services across the state's 25 Child and Family Connection offices. And step four. This is a pilot work in the two Child and Family Connection offices, which will enhance eventual statewide rollout of automatic eligibility for early intervention, as well as enhance development of guidance for early intervention providers to best support families with lead-exposed children and build resources for medical providers and families. The literature review included charting the definitions of every state that explicitly or implicitly recognizes lead or toxic exposure as part of their EI eligibility definition. Fifteen states have automatic eligibility for lead-exposed children as a medical condition with a high probability of developmental delay, though the cutoff varies widely, as you can see. Part of the literature review also involved reviewing states' implementing rules and regulations and reaching out to early intervention program administrators in other states to learn what types of services children who enter EI due to lead exposure receive. We were frankly shocked to learn that not one state, even Michigan, had any guidance around service provision. And when we reached out to states, we were met with responses that ranged from surprise that lead was included in their eligibility criteria to responses that children who were lead exposed while eligible for EI received services only once delays manifest. In our EI and lead work group, we decided that automatic eligibility without services would be meaningless. While we recognize that due to the 
at-risk profile of many children with elevated lead levels, a significant number of them have delays that without automatic eligibility would not be enough to qualify for them for the program, such as a 20% domain delay rather than a 30% delay. But that isn't sufficient. We want to rethink interventions proactive, intervening early in order to lessen or even ameliorate the delays that we know so many lead-exposed children can manifest later. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before the worker could make a recommendation regarding automatic eligibility, we need to look at the data and think about whether or not early intervention programs across the state had the capacity to serve an influx of lead-exposed children. This graph broken down by Illinois' 25 Child and Family Connections offices shows the number of children each year from 2014 to 2016 that were identified with a lead level of 5 and above. To give you an idea, the total number of children with lead levels in 2016 ranges from 28 in CFC 5 at the very top of the state to a high of 393 in CFC 9, which is in Chicago. Overall in Illinois in 2014, 6,283 children had a lead level of 5 and above. In 2015, that number was 5,063, and although the 2016 numbers are not yet publicly available, Pre-release data indicate 5,123 lead exposed birth to three-year-olds at levels of five and above. In 2014, I'm sorry, the 2014, 2015, and pre-publication 2016 blood lead reporting data from the Illinois Department of Public Health, Chicago Department of Public Health, and Cook County Department of Public Health and the EI referral and eligibility numbers for each CFC also allowed us to map the impact on the caseloads at each of the 25 CFCs. For purposes of mapping, we calculated that 50 to 75 percent of children with lead levels at 5 and above would be referred to EI. Our calculations rested on three assumptions. First, there will be children with elevated lead who have already been connected to EI for other eligibility reasons. Second, not all families will want EI services. Third, not every family will be referred because medical providers will have meaningful conversations with families to determine if EI is appropriate given family priority, capacity, and current ability to support their child's development. The color coding on the maps correlates to the percentage increase in CFC caseloads. We did the same mapping in Chicago. You will notice in Chicago, all CFCs change color coding from 2016 actuals to 2017 projections, except CFC 8, meaning there will be fewer lead-exposed children who will need to access EI, a trend consistent with decreased lead exposure prevalence over time. And although not shown, the Cook County CFC mapping is consistent with Chicago and the rest of the state. Our EI and lead working group examined the data and felt comfortable preliminarily recommending that EI establish automatic eligibility at a lead level of five and above, keeping in mind that a recommendation will need to be mindful of what happens around decisions at IDPH regarding public health intervention, moving from Illinois' 10 to the Center for Disease Control level of five. As I stated, when we conducted our literature review, we discovered 15 states which permit automatic eligibility, but deeper investigation revealed that they routinely failed to provide services to affected children. In order to rethink interventions proactive, we decided that providers would benefit from education and recommendations around innovative practices for serving children who've been lead exposed and their families, with particular recommendations around serving those children who are not yet demonstrating delay. As we worked to develop the guidance, we realized that in order to translate policy into practice, we needed to engage boots on the ground to shape and evaluate implementation. With funding from ICDD, we will be piloting automatic eligibility and service guidelines at two CFCs. We're also talking to a foundation for, about support for more robust evaluation of child and family outcomes and medical provider engagement and eventually statewide implementation. One of the pilot communities is CFC1 located in Northwest Illinois. In 2016, there were 220 children birth to three with elevated lead levels in CFC1. 
Most of the cases came from Winnebago County. It is the highest population county served by CFC1 and home to Rockford. Rockford demographics are approximately 57% white, 21% black, 17% Hispanic or Latino. Only 22% of residents over 25 years of age have a bachelor's degree or higher. 23% of residents live in poverty. The median household income is above 40%. The majority of its housing stock was built before 1979. Accordingly, it is not surprising that Winnebago County shows the greatest percentage of children with elevated lead levels in CFC1. CFC7 is our second pilot site. CFC7 serves suburban Cook County. In 2016, there were 363 children birth to three with lead levels at five and above. In fact, there are 17 high-risk zip codes in suburban Cook County, and 11 of them are in CFC7. CFC7's service area includes Berwyn and Cicero, which are the two largest villages served by the CFC, and both have high minority and low-income populations and old housing stock. The demographic information for both CFCs will assist us in rolling out the pilot as we seek to target EI providers and physicians serving children in the areas with the greatest concentration of lead-exposed children. We have the asked benefit in CFC7 that it is a lead hazard reduction demonstration grant program. So we are hopeful providers working with families in this pilot will also learn how to make referrals for grants that pay for lead safe renovation work in the areas indicated on the map. Much of what we have talked about today and more will be captured in the service guidelines document that is currently being drafted and will be utilized by the EI providers who are participating in the pilot. As the pilot proceeds, there will be opportunities to both modify and enhance the guidelines to ensure they are as useful as possible to providers working with children who have been lead exposed. Once Illinois moves to statewide rollout, we want practitioners to feel supported in this work. So, do you routinely work with children who you know have been lead exposed? If you're not sure, that's okay. For all of you, regardless of your response to this question, we sincerely hope that this webinar will positively impact your practice either now or in the future. Per the CDC, it is reasonable to hypothesize that lead exposed children would benefit from the types of interventions shown to be effective in facilitating the neurodevelopment of other groups of children. Programs in which participation begins prior to age three or those that include procedures to foster both child development and parenting skills may be most effective. While the only way to fully prevent neurodevelopmental deficits from lead is to prevent lead exposure itself, early intervention can help. As early childhood providers, you are working with families and children and you have the ability to empower parents with the skills to aid in their child's neurodevelopment and to assist children in overcoming developmental challenges. While the service guidelines document that we previously mentioned is not available yet, we do have a list of some resources that we think might be useful to use with families in the meantime. One great resource is the Zero to Three website. Zero to Three Family, Friend, and Neighbor Care provides a number of resources for care providers. The resources fall into a few different categories. Examples include supporting early brain development, tuning into temperament, encouraging school readiness, and nurturing early play skills. All resources can be printed in English and Spanish. This slide has one example of an activity for helping to prepare children to cope with frustration. This may be one of the parenting resources that would be helpful to share with a family who has a child with a history of lead exposure, as these children may have or develop impaired emotional regulation. The Vroom app is free and available in Spanish or English as well on any Apple or Android phone. It is specifically for children five years of age and under and contains a set of tools and resources that are designed to inspire families to turn everyday moments into brain building moments by layering learning activities into daily routines. Vroom lets you create a child profile and will send you daily tips based on a child's age. It also tells you how that tip is helping the child's development. This is something that you can download for yourself and encourage your families to download. 
The Centers on the Developing Child at Harvard University is composed of a multidisciplinary team that is committed to driving science-based innovation in policy and in practice. The ultimate goal of the center is to produce substantially larger impacts on the learning capacity, health, and economic and social mobility of young children. They have a website that is full of resources to help care providers support a child's development. For example, they have a 16-page guide that describes a variety of activities and games that represent age-appropriate ways for adults to support and strengthen various components of executive function and self-regulation in children. The activities on the slide are directly from the document and are intended for children between 18 and 36 months of age. Does anyone use the Ages and Stages questionnaire or the associated learning activities? I'm curious because although it is not free or readily available online, it does serve as a great resource that we plan to give those providers who will be participating in the pilot. For those of you who aren't familiar with this resource, the ASQ Learning Activities book has pages that list activities by age and development category, including fine motor, gross motor, communication, personal, social, and problem solving. It is based off of the questions asked in the Ages and Stages Questionnaire, or the ASQ, which is a commonly used developmental screening tool. A Spanish Learning Activities book is also available. On this slide is an example of an activity from the book in the fine motor category for kids between 12 and 16 months of age. And here is another example of an activity in the problem solving category for a child between the ages of 16 and 20 months. Obviously, the child in the picture to the right of the slide is a bit older, but you get the gist. One of the goals of the pilot is to provide early interventionalists reach out and read material to give to families of children who have been lead exposed. As we've seen, reading can be an area where lead exposed kids fall behind. So we have teamed up with Reach Out and Read, which is a program that encourages parents to read aloud daily to their infants, toddlers, and preschools, preschoolers as a simple and effective way of fostering, nurturing, language risk family interactions that support brain development. EI providers can also assist families by providing some recipe suggestions in order to improve nutrition and avoid deficiencies that lend themselves to increased lead absorption. The EPA has a document available in English and Spanish called Fight Lead Poisoning with a Healthy Diet with suggested meals including the ones listed on the slide. And finally, you can talk to families with lead exposed children about how to prevent further lead exposure. These tips are small changes a family can make to help protect their kids. Most of these have to do with keeping a clean home. Lead dust is the leading cause of lead exposure, so keeping kids away from areas where it might be present, like parts of a home with old paint or outdoor areas with bare soil, can help. Also, keep hands and toys clean, particularly if a child chews on them, and wipe dusty surfaces with a wet cloth. Remind families living in older homes to seek professional help or guidance before remodeling if they may have lead paint. And if a family thinks they may have lead in their water, tell them to run the water on cold before using the tap. For more information about reducing environmental exposure, you can check out the Lead Safe Illinois website. In addition to the work we are doing to move forward EI automatic eligibility for children who have been lead exposed, there's other work that is happening that should lead to important changes and improvements in both identifying and serving these children. Given the Governor's Children's Cabinet's prioritization of lead, during 2018, IDPH will be working with a wide network of stakeholders to first, lower the level of concern from 10 to 5 per CDC guidelines, which means that at those lower levels, families should receive both an environmental inspection and nurse case management. This will take significant additional resource allocation in order to be implemented. Second, a detailed analysis of lead reporting by University of Chicago's Urban Labs will help inform whether or not IDPA should move from the current targeted blood lead screening to universal screening as is required in Chicago. Third, in an effort to align age testing protocols across the state, IDPH with stakeholder input will be developing a new algorithm for testing children, which will continue to incorporate the Medicaid requirements. 
These, along with other efforts to improve primary and secondary lead poisoning prevention, are on the horizon during 2018. According to Child Trends, if children with previous exposure to lead do not receive appropriate early interventions, lead-related deficits can ripple through their entire lives. As Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, the hero of Flint advocates, uh, of the hero of Flint advocates that quote we cannot sit back and wait 20 years to see the consequences of lead poisoning in our schools and in our criminal justice system. There are ways to mitigate damage, and we can do things now that can lessen the impact. This is a unique opportunity to build a model public health program. This is the model that we hope to build in Illinois. We thank you for your time and your interest. Thank you so much, uh, Amy and Nikki. This was an awesome webinar, so much information, so many good things happening, uh, and so many things to look forward to in the future. So again, I want to thank you for presenting your um, this wonderful topic for us. Um, with that being said, our webinar has ended, and I want to wish everyone else a great day. Thank you.